Amen. Well, it's time for Jam Club, Jesus and Me. All right, great to see them all. Fantastic. It kind of makes me sad now because the church is half, only half full now. <laughs> well, that's great. Isn't that wonderful? And uh, we're grateful for those who are using the brother... Brother Robert, Miss Connolly driving the bus and they're, they're picking them up. That's wonderful. That's great. Very excited. And of course, some were brought with family and we appreciate that very much as well. All right, now, does everybody have one of these? Anybody need? You'll need one of these tonight. Okay, one over here. Miss Melissa needs one. Okay, we should have printed off enough, I think, for everyone. And do you know what? We were here last, we were here last week. It just shows you, that, of course, it doesn't surprise you that I would do this. And Miss Erica Bowman is here all the way from Africa. She's here for her sister's wedding, and I didn't mention her at all last week. Sorry about that, Erica. Just went completely right out of my mind. But anyway, welcome back, and uh, trust everything goes well for the wedding. And uh, of course, she'll be back to Africa before she knows it, but we're glad that you got to get home with the COVID and everything, because she had to actually drive, or I guess you drove to Uganda, and the fly to Uganda, because uh, Ghana, no, sorry, Kenya, where she is, Nairobi, uh, all the airports closed down because of COVID, couldn't fly out, so it's, an, it's, it's a bit of an adventure, really, isn't it? You know, you got to go to a different country to get the, the fly and get home. Anyway, it sounds adventurous to me. We're glad to see you here tonight. All right, well, let's turn, please, to uh, Genesis chapter 5, Genesis chapter 5, and... I have thought about reading this whole chapter, and, uh, you know, I think we might just go ahead and do it. I'm going to read fast, and I want you to listen fast, because we want to get through this, um, because we want to get to our, our outline tonight. It's hard to preach on, on a chapter if you don't actually read it. It's important that you, you know, first step when you're studying something is you've got to read it. Okay, so let's do this in Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. This is the book of the generation of Adam, in the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him, male and female, created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. And Adam lived an hundred and thirty years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were eight hundred years and he begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Adam lived were nine hundred and thirty years and he died. And Seth lived an hundred and five years and begot Enos. And Seth lived after he begot uh, Enos, 807 years, and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. And Enos, lifted, or sorry, Enos lived 90 years and begot Canaan. You notice how old they are when they actually have their babies? They're, they're like around 100 years old or 65 and older. Verse 10, and Enos lived after he begot Canaan 815 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Enos were 905 years, and he died. And Canaan... Uh, lived 70 years and begot Mahalilil, and Canaan lived after he begot Mahalilil 840 years and begot sons and daughters, and all the days of Canaan were 910 years, and he died. And Mahalil lived 60 and 5 years and begot Jared, and Mahalil lived after he begot Jared 830 years and begot sons and daughters, and all the days of Mahalil were 890 and 5 years, and he died. And Jared lived in 160 and two years, and, and he begot Enoch. 
And Jared lived after he begat Enoch 800 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Jared were 960 and two years, and he died. And Enoch lived 60 and five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. I don't know about you, but that's a little breather right there. That's a breath of fresh air because here's somebody that didn't die. There's an exception here. Verse 25, and Methuselah lived, nine, sorry, lived 180 and seven years and begot Lamech. And Methuselah lived after he begot Lamech 780 and two years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. Methuselah was the oldest man. You ever heard of, you know, as old as Methuselah? The oldest man to ever live at 969 years. And verse number 28, And Lamech lived in 180 and two years and begat a son. And he called his name Noah, saying, This same shall comfort us. The word Noah means rest. The same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. And Lamech lived after he begat Noah 590 and five years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Lamech were 770 and seven years and he died. And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Father, thank you for your precious word. Help us, Lord, to understand it and how it applies to our lives today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, let's look at our notes. This is the death chapter, and he died. Oh, it's repeated eight times here. The Bible says it's appointed on the man once to die, but after this, the judgment. And so Genesis chapter 5 must be one of the most depressing chapters in the Bible. Uh, because it's all about the reality and certainty of death, although there is that exception uh, with Enoch. So first of all, we, we, we see how long each of these men lived. Um, the average age of these men is 912 years, and Meth with Methuselah being the oldest one at 969 years old. It's interesting, Methuselah means, the name means, uh, when, he, uh, when he dies, it shall come. Something like that. When he dies, it shall come or it shall happen. And will you, when you look at your chart here in just a second, you're going to find that Methuselah died. If I get my little thingy going here. Uh, Methuselah, here he, here he is right here. And you know when he died? He died right before the flood. That's why he's the, the Bible says that God is long suffering. That's why he's the oldest one alive. Because God waited and waited and waited and waited. When he dies, it's coming. The judgment is coming. Okay. So you say, well, you know, how did men live almost a thousand years? And I'll just remind you that in the millennial kingdom, it's going to be a thousand years old, and people will be going into that kingdom in mortal bodies. And we've talked about this before. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah that a man will die at a hundred years old as a child. In other words, if you die in the millennial kingdom when you're a hundred years old, you'd be considered a child. Okay. And, and really, it's only the wicked who will die in that period of time. Now, no wicked get to go in. It's only saved people that, go in, that get to go in there, but they're going to have children. They're going, they're going to be in mortal bodies. And I believe that um, there's, no, there's no record of resurrection of these mortal people that go into the kingdom. And it could be the fulfillment of John chapter 11 when Jesus said, he, he, that he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. What does that mean? If you live and you believe upon him that you will never die, that's an ex extraordinary statement. Um, and so we're basically built to live through that thousand years. Now, I don't know what happens after that. The Bible just is silent about that. But, you know, God made Adam to live forever in his mortal body. And it was only because sin, the Bible says in uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 12, wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. Therefore death passed upon all men for that all of sin. And so it wasn't in the plan of God, uh, but it was, it was because of Adam's disobedience. Uh, well, you know, what caused them to live that long? We don't know. It could have been genetics. We know that genetics is, it's things, man's, not, man's DNA is not getting better and better. It's getting worse and worse and worse. And it could be that right at the very beginning here, before the flood, uh, that God did not limit that. And so the genetics of man, but also there's other factors. Some people believe that the barometric pressure on the earth, some people believe that that water canopy that was above the earth kept a, a higher pressure, barometric pressure, which actually caused 
uh, people to live longer and animals as well. And, you know, in the, in the, in the ge geological columns, the, the layers, the fossil records that we have, we have things, animals and even seashells that are like massive. Like there's on, on top of mountains, and you can check this out if you don't believe me, there's like uh, clams that are like the size of like a, um, like a Volkswagen. It's, they're massive. And there's many things in the, in the fossil record that are just like way beyond the size that we have uh, in, in our world today. And uh, they say because maybe the oxygen content was, was higher, the barometric pressure. If you hurt yourself, if a football player hurts himself, they put them in these bar barometric chambers and they up the oxygen and the, the barometric pressure and it actually speeds the healing process. So what we're saying, I've said this before, what the world was like before the flood, we have no idea what it was like. Uh, but we simply trust what the Bible says. And the Bible says Methuselah was 969 years old. He was. Okay. Now, it wasn't until after the flood in Genesis chapter 6 that God said that he would... And we're not quite sure. If you look over the page there, Genesis chapter 6, um, down in verse number 3, the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also was flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Now, whether that means that there's 120 years until, because God is long-suffering, waiting until the judgment comes, was that 120 years that Noah was building the ark? You know, I've always kind of said that. But it also could be that after this judgment took place, that God would limit man's lifespan to about 120 years, okay? And we're usually under that now. You know, I think the oldest person in our generation is like 115 or something like that. But that's, you know, still under 120. But let's look at this. This is kind of interesting. The second thing we want to look at is this. Notice how these lifespans overlap. Now, I think this is absolutely amazing. Because, because of the longevity, um, when, if you just bring, you know, a line down here, you will see that, for example... Um, on my map here, you'll see that Adam and Methuselah overlap by 250 years. Okay, so here's Adam up here. Uh, here's Methuselah. There's, there's the line of, of Adam's death. So Lamech was alive. Methuselah was alive for, for 250 years. So he could have went and visited uncle or grand, grand, great, 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 great grandfather Adam, right? And so do you think Adam would have, have stories to tell? Maybe about the Garden of Eden, what it was like and the whole relationship with God. And you remember Adam actually saw God create things in the garden. He was, he was a bystander as God was bringing forth the trees and the animals that were in the garden that he named. So, boy, wouldn't you like to sit down with Adam for half an hour and have a little chat with him? Well, Methuselah had 250 years to do that. So then, but when, then, when you have Methuselah, we see that Noah uh, overlaps Methuselah's life by hundreds of years, but particularly um, Noah's son, Shem. Now, Noah was 500 years old before he had Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And, were, you know, were they triplets? I don't know, but it doesn't say, you know, when they were each born as far as their years after that. There is a firstborn. There's a middle, and there's the, um, the youngest. And uh, we're going to get into that later, because that's really important when you get to uh, chapter 9, I think it is. Anyway... So you have um, Methuselah overlaps with Adam, and Shem overlaps with Methuselah. But look, look how long Shem lived. And if you bring this line down, Shem was alive when Isaac was alive. So Shem could have known certainly Abraham. Now, okay, well, when did, where and when did they meet? We don't know. Okay, but they were, they were contemporaries. They were still alive. But even more important than that, right down here with uh, Jacob. Jacob was alive for 50 years um, toward the end of Shem's life. So Adam knew Methuselah. Methuselah knew Shem. And Shem knew Jacob for 50 years. So, I mean, that's all of that period of history where information and the stories would have been passed down. I want you to notice in chapter 5 there are Genesis in verse 1, it says, this is the book of the generation of Adam. Now, what is this book of the generation? I mean, he says the same thing over in chapter 2, uh, verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth uh, when, uh, when, uh, when they were created in the day that the Lord God made that. In other words, we believe that there were actually records written down that Adam had. 
And if you go over to chapter, uh, chapter 10, it says again, now these are the generations of the sons of Noah. Hem. I mean, this is all detailed family trees. And where, where did all that come from? Now, obviously, this was written by Moses, and it is inspired by God. And so God could have just said to Moses, write these words, and that's, you know, that, that, that's the way it would happen. But it could be that, that Moses had source materials, that these things were passed down, and Adam could have passed it down to Methuselah, and Methuselah could have passed it down to Shem, and Shem could have passed it down to Abraham or, or Jacob. And so Jacob went down into, into Egypt, and they were there for 400 years. And then Moses comes along, and you got the Exodus, and you have the, the Ten Commandments, and you have Moses writing the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. So it could be that Moses himself actually had not only the oral traditions and the oral stories that were passed down from generation to generation, there could have been writings. This is the genealogy. So that's kind of interesting, I think. I want you to look also, look at Genesis chapter 47. Look at Genesis chapter 47. You see, one of the things this actually teaches us is if you go back, because some people believe the world's like, you know, 4.5 billion years old, okay? And they think that humanity is, uh, you know, the latest thing on the block, but we're still millions and millions and millions of years old, right? You open your textbooks in the school, millions of years ago, the dinosaurs room, okay. But, you know, if you take the, and let me say a couple of things about this. Okay, this chart was put out by Kent Hovind, okay? And I had it on my notes, and that's why you have it tonight. Kent Hovind was one of the best creation speakers I've ever known, as far as debating, okay? Now, we can't endorse Kent Hovind today. He's a disaster. He's been married three times or something. He was put in jail for tax evasion for 10 years and stuff. And when you, when you look at where he's at right now, you just you cannot endorse it, okay? But there's, there's some notes on here that are still kind of interesting uh, about the age of the earth. We are young earth creationists, okay? We believe the earth was created about 6,000 years ago. Now, if you don't believe that, there's, there's certain scientific things that you've got to deal with. Some of those are on, though, if you can read the, read the little small writing. But I always think about the population of the earth. When I went to Tennessee Temple, the population was 4.5 billion people. Right now, it's over 7 billion people. It's almost double in just my lifetime. If you, if you go back a few thousand years, you can put 7 billion people in 6,000 years easily. But if you go back like 100,000 of years, this, people could, this, this planet should have so many people that you can't even move. There would be thousands of billions of people on the, on the earth, right? We'll say, well, maybe they all die through wars and stuff. Well, where's, the, where's all the graves? Where's, all, where's the fossil record of, of human beings? Millions, billions of human beings. You just, you, you just can't put the population of humanity in hundreds of thousands of years, let alone millions of years. And scientists know that. There's all kinds of evidences for a young earth. But when you look at this genealogy, I mean, because the Bible gives you genealogy in the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Matthew concerning the, the, the genealogy of Jesus 2,000 years ago, takes it right back, and it fits into that period of time, about 4,000 B.C. So that's one of the interesting things about this, because the Bible writes it down, and you can cross-reference it. That's why it tells you, you know, how old they were, how old, when they, how old they were when their son was born, how old when they died. But you see... Those dark blue ones, you can actually count it up and you can see how many years ago that they actually lived. Now, look at Genesis 47 and verse 7. Just to show you that even the patriarchs, like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that they were aware. I mean, they, they lived till they were old. Um, uh, uh, Abraham, I think, was 175 and Isaac was 180. And now you're going to look here. Uh, here's Jacob down in Egypt, and he goes before Pharaoh, and they're having this little conversation. Uh, verse 7, Joseph brought in Jacob, his father, and set him before Pharaoh. This is Genesis 47. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto Jacob, How old art thou? And, and Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimings. Yes, I love that. You know what a pilgrimage is? It means I'm, I'm, a, I'm a stranger passing through. Um, this is really not my home. In fact, not only is Egypt not my home, but uh, Canaan is not my home. 
Earth is not my home. I'm just a pilgrim passing through. Okay, so the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. And he says, he's 130 at this point. And he doesn't die until he's uh, 147. Okay, so he's not, still, not dead just yet. But 130, I mean, if I was 130 years, I think I've done a good, uh, I've lived a long time. But notice why he says about living 130 years. He says, the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been. And by the way, if you study Jacob's life, he really had a sad life. A lot, a lot of problems in Jacob's life. But then he goes on to say, and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. Now, I understand Abraham's 175, so he's a little short of Abraham, and Isaac would be 180, so he's a little short of... But is that really what he's saying? Because when you look at this, he was uh, conversant. Jacob's conversant with, the, with, with Shem, and you know he knew that Shem lived for... Uh, 600 years? Well, 600 years, I mean, 135 or 130 years compared to 100, uh, 600 years is like, that would really be, you know, if you're just off 20 years, that's really not anything to say anything about. But if you're off like 450 years, that would be something to talk about. And, you know, and 600 years, that's nothing to the, the, the fathers before that, 770, 969 and the average age of these guys was 912 years. I think that's kind of interesting. And I think that kind of, uh, if that's what he's referring to, it would certainly make a lot of sense. It's really interesting. Okay, let's look then at our outline under number one. Because this chapter is about death. And this is going to be important for you and for me. Because death is something you should think about every day. Because death is something that could happen to you every day, right? And the Bible says, prepare to meet thy God. Did you know that you can be prepared to meet death? But we're going to look at some issues concerning this, and I think it will be helpful to all of us. First of all, uh, under number one there, death is the fulfillment of God's warning. And I think this is a very important thing. Look back to Genesis chapter 2, and let's read what God said about it right at the very beginning. In chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 16 and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the, of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, did Adam die that day? Well, there's different kinds of death. His relationship with God was broken. What is death? It's separation. You know, usually we think of death as physical death. Well, what is that? The Bible says as the, the body without the soul is dead. Death happens when the soul leaves the body. That's physical death. But there is a spiritual death when men are separated from God. And that was like Brother Zach mentioned this on Sunday night. I never even thought about it before. But um, once they were expelled from the garden, they didn't see God anymore. When they were in the garden, God was coming around and said, hey, hey, Adam, how's it going today? You know, they, they fellowship. They, they walked in the cool of the... They didn't experience that. That's, to me, that's, that's got to be the saddest thing about it. His, his relationship with God died that very day. And of course, man is born like that. Man is born separated from God. And we have to be reconciled with God through Jesus Christ in order to have that relationship restored. And then we're going we're to live in his house forever, which is going to be fantastic. But the point is this, look, look at chapter 3 and verse number 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. Jesus said that Satan is a, is a liar and the father of it. Satan is a liar. He is a deceiver. And so he comes along, he's subtle, very subtle. He's talking to the woman and starts talking to her about the tree and all of that and and she says, he, he shall not, God says, uh, verse 3, he shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it. That's not true. God just didn't, he just said, don't eat it. He didn't say, don't touch it. He didn't say, don't look at it. He said, don't eat it. She's adding to it. Lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. How many times has Satan talked to you about things and says, it's not really, gonna, it's not really that bad. It's not really that serious. It's not really that big of a sin, is it? He's a liar. And by the way, once you succumb to that temptation, then he, 
he's, you know, the word Satan is adversary, so he's going to be the tempter. But then once you succumb to that, then his other name kicks in. The other name is devil, diabolos. The word diabolos, the name diabolos means accuser. He's an accuser of the brethren. So it's not really a big thing. And then when you, once, you, once you commit that sin, oh, how could you do that? And you're a Christian. And he accuses you. He's wicked. He's your enemy. He's my enemy too. But we see here how clearly he spoke against God. He says, you shall not surely die. But what, what's the evidence? The evidence is, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. And what that teaches me is this. When God warns about something, you better listen. And whatever God says, whether it's a warning or whether it's a promise, God can be trusted. Whatever he says, no matter how improbable, unlikely, impossible, if God says it, you can take it to the bank. The whole whole world will, will doubt it. But I'm telling you, if God says it's going to happen, it will happen. You can believe it. And God has a very long track record. If you read the Bible, you'll find that for yourself. So death is the fulfillment of God's warning. God keeps his word, always does. Number two, death is the last enemy to be destroyed. Now, I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, if you've ever taken psychology classes, I've, I've taken some psychology classes in, uh, in university in Chattanooga. It was Christian University. Of course, obviously, we had a Christian worldview about it. Um, but many universities, most universities, don't have a Christian word of view. And so um, I remember taking a class about, really it was about, I can't remember the name of it, but it was, it was about lifelong psychology, the psychology of life. Okay, so, he, so the class started with birth, ended with death. And most secular psychologists or psychiatrists or, anybody, or uh, philosophers will tell you that you have the natural cycle, okay? What was that cartoon film about the, the land? Was it The Land King? The cycle of life? Wasn't there a song or something about the cycle of life? I think I tried to watch it one time. It didn't work very well. But anyway, they have this whole philosophy of the cycle of life, birth and death. And of course, some of them believe in reincarnation and all that, which is wrong. But what they say is that death is a natural conclusion to life. Now, of course, it's, it's all we've ever known. People get born, they live, and of course, people die at all ages. Anybody too warm in here? No. <laughs> for for Annika sitting back there with her coat on, she said, no, <laughs> I'm roasting over here. It's, it's on heat, so I'll just leave it, okay? Anyway, until we, <laughs> maybe we'll have another vote later on. <laughs> I'll take my coat off. How's that? I'll, I don't know, I'm warmer on Wednesday night than I am on Sundays for some reason. But let me ask you something. Is death really natural? Is there not something inside of you that says, I mean, this just doesn't make sense to me. We come into this world and we we go through a process of learning. We go to school. But, of course, the first first school we have is our family. I can remember when I was, before I ever went to school, I can remember getting up, my mommy getting me up early in the morning. I can remember, I can still remember what it is like to put my head on my mommy's lap. Do you ever remember that? You're standing beside your mommy and you put your head down on her lap, her knees. I still remember what that feels like. And I can remember the relationship I had in my home. Anyway, you you learn things. You grow up. You learn things. You you, you get to do things and experience life. But the best best thing in life, of course, is relationships. And we learn to grow to love people. But then at the end of life, if you you make it that far, all those relationships you lose. Someone said that growing old is really the art of losing everything graciously you lose your health you lose your strength but more importantly than that you lose people you lose your loved ones and it is it's tragic it's absolutely tragic and there's something i think i mean it's i certainly feel it maybe you do too but there's something inside me that says hey, this is there's something wrong here this is not the way it's supposed to be right and I've, I've preached as my, I don't like death, and I don't agree with death. And, and people say, well, I don't like hell, I don't, I, there is no hell. Well, I, I, I don't like hell, but it's real. I don't like death, but it's real. There's many things in experience that we don't agree with, we don't like, but they're, they're still, it's still there. And what I'm saying here is that death is actually unnatural. It, it's, it's not really in the program of God from the beginning. It's something that has 
entered in. Now, where do you get that? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, please, if you would. Now, 1 Corinthians 15 is the resurrection chapter, but obviously you can't have a resurrection, most times anyway, without dying first. The rapture, of course, is an exception to that. Um, but if you notice down here in 1 Corinthians 15 and in verse number 26, it says, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Have you ever thought of death being an enemy? That one day is going to be vanquished, that one day is destroyed. Now, Jesus has the keys of hell and death, and the, the, you know, the, the program is playing out. And that's why if you go over to 1 Corinthians 15, the last part of the chapter, there in verse 51, it says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Now, when it talks about a mystery, it's, saying, it's giving you new information, something that's not in the Old Testament. Okay, is resurrection in the Old Testament? Yes. The Bible talks about the resurrection of the just and the unjust. Daniel chapter 12, uh, Job chapter 19, I know that my Redeemer lives, that his feet shall stand upon the earth, and in that day I shall see, in my flesh I shall, shall see God, even though worms will destroy this body. Job says, in my flesh I shall see God. Well, that's resurrection. So resurrection is not a new topic. But what is a new topic is actually getting a resurrected body before you die. And that's what he's saying in verse 1. Behold, I show you a mystery, something new information. We shall not all sleep. Now he's talking about sleep, there is death. We're not all going to die. But we shall all be changed. Because at the rapture, the first thing that happens is the dead in Christ shall be raised first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. So they're resurrected. As, as you would expect. But then there's us who are still alive. We get resurrected and we, we haven't died. In other words, the Bible says we're going to receive a body like unto Christ's glorious body, like his resurrection body after he came out of the tomb. That's the kind of body we're going to have. In 1 John chapter 3, it says that we shall, we shall be like him when he comes. Okay, so as we read on here, verse 52, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, by the way, Again, this is something that just come to me just in the last year or two. We think of the rapture as in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. That's not what it says. It says the change happens in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. What's the importance of that? Well, some people think the rapture is you, you just disappear. Nobody, no, it's, they call it the secret rapture. Where, did, where in the Bible says it's a secret? Okay. Um, and the, the word harpazo is the word that is used in... Revelation chapter 12 concerning Jesus' ascension from the Mount of Olives. And they watched them go up. And the angel said, the same Jesus that is taken from you shall so come in like manner. We're going to see him when he comes back again. And they saw him go. So there's, the change will happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. But as we go up, great possibility that it's going to take some time. Now, I don't think it's going to take forever. I think it's going to be pretty quick. But it's not just you just disappear. Okay, so that's, that's a correction in my thinking because, again, we just assume this is speaking about the event, but it's actually talking about the change in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality, so when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass... The saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. This is the, this is the defeat of death. Because <laughs> once this happens, you realize that death is never going to touch you again. Amen. There's no possibility of it. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so... The Bible says that death is an enemy. In other words, it's okay for you not to like it. See, as Christians, we're supposed to, you know, accept it, and we do. But it's only because of what Christ has promised us that we accept it. But, that, you know, the, the, the fact, you know, if, if a Christian dies and, and then other Christians expect you to have a smile on your face or something, well, just trust the Lord's wonderful, they're with the Lord in heaven. No, death is an enemy. And I hate death. And one day death will be destroyed. So death is unnatural. It's universal and unavoidable. But thankfully God has provided an answer to it. There is an answer to death. And I don't have time really to get into all of this. But you know, um, there's an interesting thing, an interesting principle in the scriptures when 
God pronounces death. The wages of sin is death. Okay, that's like the law of the Medes and the Persians. When the, when the, the Medes and the Persians put a law on the books, you know, even the king himself couldn't change it. That's why Daniel had to go into the lands then. Because the old king had signed it. The king couldn't say, now bring that back. I want to rub that out. The law of the Medes and the Persians, Daniel had to go into the den. Some things can't be changed. And when God says the wages of sin is death, he means it, and there's no exception to that. Now let me give you some illustrations of that. Moses, the Pharaoh, said, baby boys, Nile River, going to drown them. Now I didn't say, maybe, and we don't know exactly what the edict was, but obviously throwing the baby boys into the Nile River would, would kill them. And do you know that uh, Jochebed and Amram, I always forget those, Moses' mommy and daddy, after three months, couldn't, couldn't hide him any longer. So they did what the Pharaoh told them to do. What would what they tell him to do? Throw him in the river. But his parents added something. Do you know what they added? They put him in the river, right? But they, they put a little ark of bulrushes together. They made a little boat for Moses. And they put Moses in the little boat. And they put the boat into the river. It was on the side of the river in the flags. And, of course, the, the Pharaoh's daughter came down, saw him, rescued him, brought him, brought him home and adopted him. And uh, Miriam was sent, his older sister, to see what was going on. She says, do you want me to go get one of the Hebrew women to look after him? I think that's fantastic. <laughs> so not only does she save her son, she gets paid for nursing him and looking after him. Brilliant. But you see the principle that it's not that they can't avoid, they can't avoid the, the Nile River, but something is added. Okay. Again, Noah, judgment was coming. God didn't say, no, and I want you to sit over here and we're going to rope off a, an acre of ground and we're going to build a big wall and the flood's not going to come anywhere near you. No, Noah was going to have to go through the flood too. But what did, he, what did God do? He added something. What did he add? Another ark. And in the ark, he was in the place of safety. Okay, uh, let's see. Well, Daniel, again, it couldn't be reversed. He had to go into the land stand. There was no way around that. So what? What happened? God added something. What did he add? The angel of the Lord was in there with him. And the angel shut the land's mouth so they could not harm Daniel. Now, when his accusers, when the king woke up the next day and says, Daniel, was, is your God able to take care of you? And he says, oh, everything's okay. Get out of there. He brought him out. He served his time. He was still okay because God added the presence of the angel of the Lord. But what about his enemies? The old king, see, they didn't, they didn't figure on this. Didn't figure on this. Bring all his enemies out here into the land's den. They didn't have anything out of it. The Lord wasn't with them. And they were all eaten. So here we have the plan of salvation. God says the weeds of sin is death. I, I love Joe. He's my father-in-law. And he's a, uh, he's a good guy. But you know what? Um... God can't look at Joe and say, I love Joe, but um, I'm just going to kind of let him, let, I'm going to make an exception for Joe because I like him. No. Eternal death. So how do we get out of that? How do we survive that? God added something. Sure. What did he add? He added Jesus. He added the cross and all the legalities. See, God has to keep his own rules. And so all of us, our sin has to be atoned for. It has to be paid for. So what happens is, in the mind of God, when Jesus died, and well, you know, obviously in time, God knows all things. He knows that we would receive Jesus. So if you just put it like this, when we receive Jesus as our Savior, he identifies us in Christ. The Bible says that we are, we're chosen in Christ. If you're not in Christ, you're not chosen. You're not blessed. You don't have anything. But when you get in Christ, and how do you get in Christ? By receiving Jesus as your Savior. Just like what he says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and I shall be saved. And you don't feel it. You probably don't understand it. Somebody said you get saved in just a moment and it takes the rest of your life to find out what happened in that moment. be honest with you, it'll take the rest of eternity to find out what happened in that moment. But what God does is, it does is he puts put you in Jesus. And when Jesus died, you died too. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And so we died with Christ, and that's why in Romans chapter 6 he says, consider yourselves to be dead. You're dead, dead to sin. So we're in Christ, and when he got buried, we got buried. And when he, when he rose from the grave, we rose too. 
Now, you see, you have to understand that le and, and Romans chapter 7 explains all of this. But legally, the law only has jurisdiction over you while you're alive. So if you die, the law is fulfilled because the worst penalty that the law will give you is death. Well, I die. Amen. But if you're, in, and if, you're, if you're outside of Jesus, you're going to stay dead. Ted, separated from God for eternity. But what happens is if you're in Christ, because Christ is stronger than death, then you're coming up with Jesus. You're standing on the other side of death. God added something. He didn't take away death. He just added a place of safety so that when you went into death, you could come back up out of death. I love that we illustrate. It's probably, it's probably a silly illustration, but I always picture this river like the, like, you know, the Mississippi. And it was full of piranha fish and sharks and alligators and all that kind of stuff. And, but you've got to go across. And everybody goes in, never comes out on the other side. They get in about 100 yards and they get eaten by an alligator or the piranha fish finish them off. And, every, and there's millions that go in. Nobody comes out on the other side. Nobody gets out to come out on the other side. And then all of a sudden, an, an armored personnel carrier, amphibious, rolls up. The door opens. And somebody inside says, come on, come on in here. And I say, Okay. And so I jump, and I, you know, we don't know what, what's going to be like in there. I don't know, but I'm going to take a risk on it. And I get inside this thing, and the door slams shut. Maybe it's dark in there. I don't know. And you can feel this machine going into the river. And then you feel the teeth of the alligator, and all the piranha fish trying to eat it. But a solid steel. And it goes across the river, and it comes up on the other side, and the door opens, and you get out. And you're standing on the other side. That's what Jesus did for us. Yeah. He said, can you lose your salvation? How is that possible? If you're truly saved. Now, I understand there's people that say they're saved. They're really not. And the Bible says, make your, your calling and election sure. Okay. But I'm just explaining what salvation is. And I don't know how I got off on that, but I'm having a good time. <laughs> God adds stuff. He doesn't violate his own rooms. He doesn't make exceptions, but he adds he adds things uh, for our salvation. So we're talking about death being the, the last enemy to be destroyed. So God has made a way through death. Okay. Number three, death should hold no fear for the believer. Now, I did this, actually, I think it was after our brother Clyde Lefebvre passed away. And obviously, Miss Carol, she's watching tonight, I'm sure. And it's, it's very difficult. But even as a terrible thing to endure. And I wanted to do this study for myself, but also wanted to share it with other people. I have notes on it somewhere. And I've, I've, done it, I've, I've taught it a couple of times here at church, at least a couple of times. And that is, I wanted to go through and see what does the Bible actually say about... And I study, first of all, what it is for a non-believer to die. That's not good. But I also, more importantly for me and for others that are believers, I wanted to see well, really what does the Bible say about believers dying? Because I don't know, I've never died before. Have you died before? Don't say yes, please. <laughs> we have never experienced that. I don't know what it's going to feel like. I don't know what, it's going, to, I don't know what I'm going to see. I don't know what I'm going to hear. I don't, I don't know what I'm going to smell. I, that's completely, we don't know these things. And you know, when you don't know things, then there's, a, there's an element of fear there because it's unknown, right? It's like in, in trepidation. But what God has done is he's given us information, things that we can know, things that we can hold on to that will take the fear away when we're looking at death or when we're um, grieving over someone who has died. So let's look at some verses concerning this. And this is, this is part of us. This is not the whole study, but it's part of it. Look at Genesis chapter 25. Genesis chapter 25. And here's what I want you to see. I want you to see, you know, when, 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 you're, when you're in danger, God is like an alarm bell. He is going to be red flags, alarm bell. This is serious. Oh, warning, woe unto you, woe unto you, danger, danger. Will Robinson, some of you don't remember that. God is really, really keen about warning us when there's real danger. And so when you're thinking about death, the death of a believer, is that something where God is like panicking or it's really, this is like, oh, it's, it's terrible. 
danger, alarm bells, flags. Is, is, is that the way God treats this? Is that the way it's treated in Scripture? So we'll look here at um, Genesis 25, verse number 8. And this is the death of, let's see, Isaac, I think. Uh, Abraham, sorry, Abraham. Okay, so verse... Um, Verse 7, and these are the days of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived, and 103 score and 15 years, so it's 175 years. Then Abraham gave up the ghost. Now, you see, the ghost is the, the word ghost is spirit, because you, you don't have a soul. You are a soul. You have a body. See? The body's going to go to dust, but the person who lives inside the house is moving house, Okay? And so he says that he gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. Now, is that a, it's only one verse there. He doesn't spend a whole lot of time on it. But that, does, is that an alarm? Is God trying to scare? I mean, is this an alarming thing when we look at this? Or is this just kind of like, mm, well, he died, you know? It's like, it's, it's not even like, it's almost like it's not even important. It only gets one verse. In other words, God is not panicked about the death of Abraham. And to be honest with you, I don't think Abraham was either. And it says that he was gathered to his people. I wonder what the first experience... The Bible says in the book of Isaiah that when we awake, we awake and sing. Maybe the first thing that you experience in the, actually the resurrection is that your resurrected body starts singing. But I wonder when you give up the ghost is the first thing you hear is people. Maybe you hear things before you see things. Maybe it's the buzz of people. You're gathered to a crowd. You're gathered onto your people. And then, I mean, how, we don't know exactly what that experience is going to be. But all I'm saying is when you look at these verses, you don't come away panicked. It's kind of like, it's okay. And it's going to be a good experience. Look over um, at chapter 35 and verse 28. Chapter 35, verse 28. And so this is Isaac. And the days of Isaac were 104 score years. It's 180. And Isaac gave up the ghost. Same words. He gave up the ghost and died and was gathered unto his people, being old and full of days. And the sons Esau and Jacob buried him. If you go on then to chapter 49, uh, that's Isaac. And then Jacob himself, it talks about him. In chapter 49, verse, 20, uh, verse 29, 49, 29. And this is, he's talking to his, his sons here. He charged them and said unto them, I am to be gathered unto my people. That's how he said, I'm going to die. He says, I've, I've got to leave. I'm sorry, I've got to go. <laughs> I'm going to be gathered unto my people. So that's how he was looking at it. And to be gathered unto my people, bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite. Then in verse 33, and Jacob, and he's sitting on his bed talking to all his sons, and then it says, when he made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into the bed, yielded up the ghost, and was gathered unto his people. He's sitting there having, I don't know if there's any time involved here, but it's almost like he's talking to his sons, he's commanding his sons, and he says, okay, that's basically all I've got to say. And so he takes his feet off the floor, puts them into the bed, lies back, and dies. And he's happy about it. He's not, he's not concerned about it at all. Now, Look at, look at Hebrews. I've got to hurry this up. Look at Hebrews chapter 2. Does God want us to be afraid of dying? No. Is there a natural fear? Because death is an enemy and we've never experienced it before and we don't, want, don't know what it is. Of course. Of course there's apprehension. And that's why God gives us these promises. And when we study what he has to say about it, we should have an inner peace that it's going to be okay. No matter what happens. It's going to be okay. Now, of course, usually death involves some sort of pain or discomfort, you know. Uh, most of you, I think most of you don't know, but um, I went for a procedure. <laughs> I'll tell you what it was last week. And uh, they put me out, you know. And uh, so they explained everything, and I'm laying on the, on the, the gurney, you know, and they've got the drip in. And then and they didn't tell me this. when you're, They gave me this stuff to put me to sleep, you know. And I started burning my hand. I thought, wait a second. <laughs> you didn't tell me it was going to burn. <laughs> and before I actually had said it all, I was out. And the next thing I remember, I'm making up, you know. And uh, that's kind of interesting. But I forget what I, told, I was going to tell you that. There shouldn't be a fear. 
even though there might be discomfort, even though you know there might be pain involved, it's short lived. Even if you know, there's many ways people die, but any discomfort or pain is usually short lived. And the thing is, when death happens, your your the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And what I'm saying is, what we're going to look at here is. God's not worried about it. If God's not worried about it, should, be, should you be worried about it? Now, if God's worried about something, I want to be worried about it because it means there's danger or there's something not right. But if God says it's okay, the Bible says precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. It's a very special thing to God because he's welcoming you home. In Hebrews chapter 2, look please uh, at verse number 14 and 15. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also, Jesus himself, likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Now watch verse 15. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. God doesn't want you to live in the fear of death. And again, I'm kind of adverse to pain. You know, I don't like pain. It hurts me. And I don't like that. And most of us don't. But it's interesting, even when Jesus in John chapter 21 talked to, to Peter about how he was going to die, he says, you get up in the morning as a young fellow, you put your jeans on, you went where you wanted to. When you're old, you'll get up and you'll stretch forth your hands and somebody else will put your clothes on because he's going to be bound. And they're going to take you, Peter, where you do not want to go. This speak he concerning by what death he would glorify God. And then Jesus said to Peter, follow me. So he, he told him what was going to happen, but he says, follow me anyway. And Peter did. And Peter did, as the other disciples, all uh, other than John, uh, died a, a martyr's death. I mean, if you were so afraid to die, then how could you become a martyr? If somebody, you know, if you got in a situation, hopefully this will never happen to any of us, but if you get in a situation where someone is saying, you know, you deny Jesus Christ or we're going to take your life, that in that moment you would have enough courage and grace and confidence and peace to say, do your worst. It's okay for me. Jesus said that. He said, don't fear those who can kill the body. He says, fear him who can kill both body and soul in hell. Don't, don't, don't fear people who, and what they can do to you physically. Now, what that means is that you have to be prepared to die. You've got to be willing to think, have, have, have that, thought through that emotionally in your head, understanding what God says about understanding the promises. And you know what? It's okay. Because guess what? If the rapture doesn't happen, all of us are going to go through that. And to be honest with you, I don't want to be a sniveling, <laughs> a carring wreck. When I face death, I don't want that to happen. I want to have confidence and courage. And it's unknown, we know that, but it's going to be okay. Yes. Look at John chapter 11. Uh, and I've got to really hurry here, but in John chapter 11, you have the story of Lazarus. And Lazarus uh, was in Bethany down in Judah. And Jesus was up in Galilee. And so in verse 1, a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. This is the brother of Martha and Mary. And, uh, so verse 3, therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Jesus was very close to Lazarus. They were, they were buddies. I mean, they, they, he loved Lazarus, loved Martha and Mary too. And when Jesus heard that he said this, when he heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Uh, verse 6, when he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Uh, verse 11, these things said he, and after that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may wake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, they're as thick as two planks, you know, you have to think. Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death. But they thought he had spoken of taking rest and sleep. So then Jesus said unto them, plainly, Lazarus is dead. Now, what does he mean? It's not unto death, but unto the glory of God. It means that Lazarus is not going to stay dead because I'm going, to, I'm going to raise him. Didn't tell him this right there because he was going to glorify himself. Actually, it was through Lazarus' death that many of the Jews believed on Jesus. Not, not Lazarus' death, but his resurrection because they were there. They embalmed him. They knew he was in the tomb four days. And if Jesus had a went 
when the, when, the, when, the, when the messengers came, he would have been there and Lazarus would still have been alive and he wouldn't have been able to help himself. <laughs> Honestly, he would, have, he would have healed him. And that's why he had to wait. He had to wait till he was dead. And then he came. And he wept with Martha and Mary, but he wasn't weeping because Lazarus, he wasn't worried about Lazarus one second. Do you know who he was worried about? The people who were grieving. He was not worried about Lazarus. And, you know, five minutes later, he's standing there and said, Lazarus, come forth, and out he comes. I'd love to have a conversation with Lazarus about what that was all about. But here's what I get. You know, I, Jesus is love. He loves you. He loves me. He loves Lazarus. But was he concerned about Lazarus because Lazarus had died? No. If Jesus is not concerned, should we be concerned? No, because no matter what we don't know about it, all you can say is it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Look, uh, here's another one. Uh, look at Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. Here is a funeral procession that Jesus comes upon. This is in the city of Nain. You've heard of this, the widow woman. Uh, okay, so in verse 11, it came to pass, the day, this is uh, Luke 7, 11. And it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him and much people. Now, when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out. It's a funeral. Now, in those, in those days, they didn't have, like, caskets with lids and everything. They are basically probably just been carried in the stretcher. I remember when I was in Romania, in Timisoara, Romania, I couldn't believe it. They actually, we were going into this, actually, like a bakery, a place to eat, restaurant. And we had, there was, like, two guys carrying this makeshift, like, it was, it was a coffin. It had, it had, like, four sides on it, but no top. And there was a, this big old guy in, in that thing, and he must have just had died or something, and they were picking up. But they were actually kind of jogging with him. That, I don't know what the rush was. And they kind of cut right through the line going into this restaurant. And all I was standing there, ready to go get something to eat. And all I, next second, I see this guy in his belly bobbing up and down in this coffin as he passes. And I'm going, what in the world? I, they would not do that in Northern Ireland. They'd at least put a lid on it, you know. And so in their day, they didn't have a casket with the lid and all. This boy was probably on a stretcher, being carried out in his funeral procession. Now, that's important because of what, what Jesus does here. A dead man carried out. Now, watch. The only son of his mother. That means she's a widow. Uh, I mean, she's penniless. She, she's a widow already. doesn't have a husband to look after. Now, she, she doesn't have any family. Here's a son that was going to be a breadwinner for her. Now, he's dead. The only son of his mother. And she was a widow. And much people of the city was with her. Now, watch verse 13. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the bar, the coffin, no lid on it. And they that bore him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. And he delivered him to his mother. Now here's what I'm saying to you. Jesus had no concern about the boy. He, was, he didn't have compassion on the boy. The boy was okay. But he saw the wee woman, and you could just imagine her grief, and he had compassion on her. And he walks over to the coffin, puts his hand on it, and they stop. He says, and he probably knew his name, and he says, get up. And the wee boy, and I don't know how old he was, you know, but he, he sat up. Could you, imagine, could you imagine his experience being, you know, you're in your own, you're, you know, you're in your own funeral and you basically set up and you're looking around and saying, where, where am I? And he delivered the boy to his mother. You can just imagine what that meant to her. But he was concerned about her. He wasn't concerned about, concerned about him. So when I was studying all of this, I thought to myself, you know what? The Lord's not worrying about me, Dan. And if he's not worrying, then I probably shouldn't be worrying either. Because even though we don't know a lot of things, he promised us. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I give unto you eternal life, and you shall never perish. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out, and hundreds of other verses. You think Jesus would go through all of what he did on the cross to give us salvation, and then for somehow that salvation to be disappointing or not to work? No, I can guarantee you. It has not entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. The last thing here is that death... This is the death chapter. Very depressing. But, 
there is an exception as we go back to Genesis chapter 5. And this is brilliant. Isn't it wonderful that in the midst of the tears that there's hope, that God always has a way out. There's always, there's always something that he adds. And in the midst of all of this death, we have Enoch. And let's just read it in uh, verse 21, 24. And Enoch lived 60 and five years and begot Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begot Methuselah 300 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. You say, what? What does that mean, God took him? Well, let's go over to Hebrews. Now, I think last time we saw that Seth was the first person mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, the great faith chapter by faith. Uh, Abel offered a more uh, excellent sacrifice. And the next guy is this guy, Enoch. So Abel is mentioned in verse 4. Enoch's mentioned in verse 5. But here's what it says. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not. Enoch was translated. What does that mean? It means he got a resurrected body without Dan. Now, um, there are two there are two people in the in the book of the Revelation, the two witnesses, okay? Uh, but I really believe some be- people believe that it's Enoch and Elijah. Because Elijah, did, he went to heaven without Dan as well. You remember the chariot of fire, fire? And so because it's appointed on a man once to die, it's appointed on the man once to die, people say, well, Enoch has to die and Elijah has to die. But they're maybe forgetting the rapture. Because at the rapture, no Christians die. We're going to go to heaven without Dan. So there's a whole generation of Christians going to go to heaven without Dan. So that doesn't fit. I really believe, when you look at the two prophets, it's Moses and it's Elijah. Okay. But Enoch basically went to heaven without dying. And in a sense, it's like a picture. It's a little glimmer of hope for us that there will be a generation of Christians that experience that. And so in Hebrews 11, verse 5, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was found and, and was not found because God had translated him for before uh, his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. In other words, God, God just took him home. They used to say that, I remember my mummy and my Aunt Dorothy, we used to live in the mountains above Belfast, and my Aunt Dorothy lived over the hill. And so um, mummy would be with Aunt Dorothy maybe all day, and then Dorothy would walk her home. She planned to walk her halfway to the top of the mountain and then go down again. And many times she walked all the way over to our house, you know, and then my mummy would have to work, walk her halfway back, you know. That's the way it went on. And somebody once said that, you know, Enoch was such a friend of God that they were out walking one day and God said to Enoch, you know what, we're closer to my house than we are to your house. Just come on home with me. <laughs> Fantastic, isn't it? Yes. But here's one who did not die. God has an exception. And you know what? We have the same promise. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus said this, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And he says this, I love this. If it were not so, I would have told you. I don't know how that touches your heart. That tells me it's real. Because if it wasn't real, he would tell me. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am there, you may be also. That's the bridegroom coming for the brain. And he's going to take us home to the Father's house. And so there is an exception. Describes 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the rapture, describes a whole generation of Christians when the Lord comes that go to heaven without dying will be changed in the moment that twinkling and I caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. So maybe one of the most depressing chapters in the whole Bible, but you know what? There's an answer to it. That's what the Bible's all about. And you know, somebody could take the Bible and throw it in the fire and say, it's a lot of nonsense. But they still got to face death. You know, you can disagree with everything I'm saying, but you and I have an appointment unless the Lord comes for us. Um, as believers, uh, the Lord's coming for us, but um, this is an appointment everybody's got to keep someday. So I'm, I'm pretty interested in it. I'm not morbid, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, but I'm, I'm interested in the, the answer to it because I got to face it. And you do too. 
And God has given us space and time to figure it out and to read and understand what he said about it so we can be ready to die. You're really not ready to live until you're ready to die. So anyway, Andy died. Father, thank you for your precious word tonight. And Lord, we're grateful for the warning of the scriptures, but we're also so grateful for your compassion and love and the thing that you've added, Lord, to rescue us from ourselves and the salvation that Jesus has provided, Lord, to rescue us from death, eternal death. Lord, we know that one day we will close our eyes in death unless you come in the rapture for us first, and that's a very real possibility. But Lord, whatever the case, we're going to be with you. And Lord, that's what we love because we love you. And we know, Lord, that it can't even be imagined uh, what things you've got prepared for us. We know that we're the apple of your eye. We're precious to you. We're, we're loved. Uh, Lord, you died for us that we might live with you. And Lord, we know that we're precious to you. So we know that even the things we don't understand, we know that it'll be okay. And we can trust you as a little child trusts his daddy and puts his hand in his father's hand when it's dark. We may not be able to see and understand all the details, but Lord, we trust you enough and we love you enough that we will put our hand in yours and Lord, you'll lead us through the valley of the shadow of death and we will fear no evil. Lord, help us all to have that confidence tonight. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.